Hello. Hello, hello. Hi, Mohamedou. How are you? I'm doing very well. Hello, I'm Harry Robinson, and this is the All Out Attack podcast. So we have a little bit, ironically, more freedom, and people just as children, as a child, I was exposed to just about everything. I was a rolling stone. <laughs> uh, no. Is that another Bob Dylan reference? My guest today is Mohamedou Old Slahi, a man who was kidnapped by American Special Forces and taken to Guantanamo Bay, where they claimed he was the head recruiter of 9-11. Because obviously obviously I watched the film and there's that that part at the end of the film where you sing uh, The Man in Me by Bob Dylan. So that's been part of my prep for speaking to you. I've just been listening to The Man in Me on repeat. (laughs) That was my uh, pitch for Hollywood, but no one called me yet. Despite having no evidence, no charge put against him, and even winning a habeas corpus case to be set free, Mohamedou spent 14 years and two months in the world's most extreme and secure prison. Mohamedou has been called the most tortured man in Guantanamo, subjected to beatings, sleep deprivation, sexual assault, a mock execution, and even threats to imprison and rape his mother, all to force him to sign a false confession. I'll get started there. I just want to say as well, I mean, obviously, You've told your story a lot, but there's some very sensitive stuff and that kind of thing. If if I ask you anything that you're not comfortable answering, please shoot me down and and, and say that you're not comfortable with it. I want you to feel like as comfortable as, as possible. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Released from Guantanamo in 2016, and now the subject of a gripping new film, The Mauritanian. you got to tell me what happened, Mahabadu. You, you, you asked me to set fire to this place, but I'm still sitting. Outside, my family, my brother, they, they, their lives go on. Tara's life goes on. But me here, I'm, I'm, I'm like a statue. Mohamedou is now a prisoner in his own country. Refused a passport and the ability to travel, he campaigns for human rights in the much bigger cell of Mauritania. I got to sit down with the embodiment of human resilience and look into the eyes of a man who's endured so much torment yet can still greet me with a smile. I hope you enjoy. I want to I want to start from early on because obviously you, your book is about your your time in Guantanamo but there is a big you know there were events leading up to your time in Guantanamo that ultimately led you uh, ending up in Cuba. You briefly joined Al Qaeda during the 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 Soviet Afghan War, when the Soviets and the uh, the Mujahideen, no, sorry, the the Americans and the Mujahideen were fighting against the Soviets. Could you talk me through how that came about and and what happened? Absolutely. <clears throat> first, I tell you first why uh, I was on the radar of the uh, most powerful country in the world, the USA and its intelligence agencies. So uh, I was living in Germany, it was 99 or end 98, and I received a phone call from my cousin. Mm-hmm. My cousin was a close associate of the late Osama bin Laden. It was just a family call. Uh, he asked me to help his father. His father was sick and he couldn't make it to Mauritania. He was wanted, mm-hmm. I guess or he was afraid. It was not big then, Al-Qaeda was not really big then, but he, uh, he just wanted me to help his father, transfer some money to his father to pay the hospital bills. Mm-hmm. And I said, of course, I did that. That call in itself was a call, just what I told you, obviously, mm-hmm. because if there was something else, I wouldn't be talking to you now. And uh, I was on the radar. After that, every move I did, everything I said, every gesture I made was interpreted in a very cynical and evil manner. Mm-hmm. You know, and I was unaware, blissfully unaware of all of this. So uh, this was like 99. I left Mm -hmm. Afghanistan seven years before that, seven years. Mm -hmm. I was very young back then. Uh, I went there as a teenager and uh, 
and I was all in my late teenage and uh, and it was like everybody want there, everybody wanted to help, you know, it was very big on TV in Germany, you know, like oppression and I just was too, too young and I wanted to change the world. But when I went to Afghanistan, I found that the news did not match the reality. The reality, the, it, it was just a civil war between uh, Russia uh, supported the regime, who was oppressing the people, and the people who were against the regime were fighting it out, you know, to make sure he's going to take over power. And ironically, the regime was the most humane side in all of this. So the so-called Mujahideen, what they did was really horrific. And I just was horrified and I said, I don't want to be part of this. I left, mm -hmm. never to come back. Was it after two months that you left? It was, it was, yes. it was a very brief, two brief month, yeah. twice, about yeah. four months, very, 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 uh, very brief in any, uh, in any book. So, but that's all haunted me, you know, it's <laughs> all, all of this time it's because when the Americans started interrogating me, it was like, okay, so you are cousin of this guy. Yes. Ah, but so tell us about your life. So you went to Afghanistan. Ah, that makes sense. Okay, now we know everything. And, uh, and that's the background of it. Yeah. So that's well, why the United States was interested in it. Well, it's, it's so oblique because I... I mean, it's the American, obviously the, the, the Mujahideen and, and Al-Qaeda as, as a faction were fighting alongside the US and the, the US and the interrogators made, you know, a big deal of twisting it, you know, to cut out the part basically where you were fighting alongside the US because Al-Qaeda, obviously after 2001, were painted as, as the enemy. Um, I, to... But obviously you talked about that that phone call um and, and the surveillance. When did you start did you start realizing at all that, that you were being surveyed in any way? Uh, so I was living in Germany mm -hmm. and everywhere I went, all the people were were like very hard. And then one time at the end of '99. The, uh, some kind of police, some kind of agency in Germany, what you would call, call in your country MI5, mm -hmm. came to uh, <clears throat> our Imam. Imam means the priest, yeah. the head of the mosque I went to. And they showed him my picture, that's the first thing. And he was laughing, he said, okay, I, what's going on? They said, this guy, was the deal with him. He was laughing, he said, I know this guy, he's really very friendly. He's, he's a really good guy. I wouldn't worry about him, he told them. Yeah. He said, as he told me this, they agreed with him, but they told him he's wanted by someone. Someone really uh, think he's a bad guy. And this was my cue, actually, actually in a way, in a way, they really wanted me to be careful and not to leave the country, you know. And that was the way they sent me this indirect message. But this freaked me out. Yeah. I never had any run with the police. And I decided to leave Germany altogether and to go to Canada. Mm -hmm. At that point, I already had my landed immigrant for Canada that is a visa that is unlimited because mm -hmm. I qualified uh, to be very wanted uh, because of my qualification, microelectronics mm -hmm. uh, engineer. And uh, my friend did it, Mohsin, he did it before me and he told me, you can apply, they will accept you. And I did and they accepted me. So I said, I go to Canada, no one knows me. CIA doesn't know me. And I just start my life afresh. Mm -hmm. You know, and this is this was so naive. It reminds me of the story of a friend of mine, Tunisian. 
when, we, when he came to Germany, he received a ticket, you know, speeding ticket or something like that. And he didn't pay. And I don't know about your country, but if you don't pay the speeding ticket, it gets really very expensive. Yeah, same here. Yeah, they kept sending him. He said, you know what? I'm just leaving the city. I'm moving to another city. Then he did that, <laughs> thinking that his speeding ticket is going away and it almost cost him like all his driver license and so much money, you know, mm -hmm. in the end. Yeah. So, and, uh, so I thought too, I'm going to Canada and Canada is very infamous for uh, working with the US intelligence. And you know, like Harry, you know, this is like, okay, you know, democracies need to protect themselves. That's what a democracy is. So you pay MI5, MI6, you pay them your money, but they protect you. They could uh, prevent, you know, any harm that comes to people. Mm -hmm. And they work to other democracies, you know, that's okay. But what is not okay is to violate you know, the rights of the citizen, they are supposed to protect because they not only protect you, your, uh, they protect your rights, actually, mm -hmm. all of your rights, including that your rights are not getting uh, like violated. But for some reason, they get so into their work looking for the bad guys that human rights and dignity uh, you know, are not the issue anymore. Mm -hmm. So I went to Canada and we say in Mauritania, falling from a cliff into a well. You know, I thought I was catching a break. Two weeks after my arrival, a guy by the name of Ahmed Rassam tried to cross the US Canadian border, you know, to mm -hmm. do harm to innocent people. For the millennium plot. Yes, the mm -hmm. millennium, the infamous millennium. They said, as luck had it, that this guy went to the same mosque as I did. I never heard of him. I never met him. I, uh, the time actually that he went to the mosque, I wasn't even in Canada because I was in, uh, in, in I was living in Montreal and he was living in Vancouver. At some point in his life, he passed through Montreal. But that was enough to make the connection. One, one plus one. So they thought I was freaking out and going, trying to protection. But they thought, no, this is all part of very careful plan for Mohammed to do all of it. And they identified me as wrongfully as the mastermind of the millennium. How did it feel to to be branded as as the mastermind when I mean you had no <laughs> no, no part to play whatsoever? Clue. Zero clue. Mm. I had nothing. I don't know anything, and I was so scared. And this this goes like from worst to worst. This is like just the beginning. So they said, "Oh, Canadian like made investigation. And they questioned me." came back to America and said, this guy, there is no evidence whatsoever. We cannot even take him to the police station because there is no evidence. And then American like, this guy is really smart. This guy needs, needs a lot more of work to take him down. Mm -hmm. And then they, uh, they, they agreed to Canadian and Mauritanian to kidnap me. But you cannot, you know, kidnapping in Canada would be a very big problem. Yeah. Because that will be in breach of so many laws. But they say we can lure him to a place where there is no law. Mm -hmm. you know, Africa, for instance. Africa is still a playing ground for human rights violation in the Middle East too, mm -hmm. where I call it no man's land. You know? And then they contacted my country, which was led by them by a military regime. He said, you need to lure him back to Mauritania. 
-hmm. They went to my mother. They told her, you need to tell him that you're sick and you call your son back. That's what happened. My mother called me. She told me she's sick and I need to come back. My friend in the community told me, Muhammad, this is a trick. You cannot leave Canada because if you leave Canada, you are going to be hurt really bad. How did they force yeah. your mom to, uh, did they force your mom to speak to you or did they coerce her or like to tell you that she was sick? They, uh, they use a ruse. Mm -hmm. They just told her, Mohamedou is in trouble. They're going to arrest him in Canada and we want to help him. So, and clear his file, but he needs to come back in order to get his file cleared. And my family was very basic and they didn't know. They never had an Iran with the law. Mm -hmm. And in Mauritania, in my country, in the military regime that used to be uh, in charge, people, when they tell you something, you do it. That's how it's done. There is no, no discussion. Yeah, it's like conditioning. So yeah. Mm -hmm. so. So, so you were under... Uh, so they they took you they they took you through Senegal wasn't it as well was it Senegal and then to Mauritania <clears throat> Senegal was my choice so mm -hmm. I it was only a matter of ticket you know mm -hmm. uh, like the ticket was good through Brussels Dakar mm -hmm. and Dakar is like five hundred kilometers from my home Nouakchott and. Uh, what you would say 300 miles. Mm -hmm. So my family was waiting on me at the airport. So. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then they just kidnapped me from, from, uh, from Dakar. And mm -hmm. the Senegalese were, you know, the Senegalese had the information, this is so-called terrorist, which is like horrible, like- No, of course. Uh, Horrible thing to say because in, in I I am a very extremist in these things since my uh, since my arrest I have become very radical in freedom and the human rights. Terrorism is a very tricky uh, thing because first this is not agreed upon. So if they say Harry is a terrorist in Iraq does not mean he's a terrorist in the UK. They have different definition. And mostly terrorism is a, a political designation to oppress political dissent and to violate human rights. And why, for instance, why didn't the United States, if I landed in Senegal, why didn't say this guy attempted to murder someone? Because this is very easy to prove. If you know, he did. <laughs> why, yeah. Because this is very easy. This is one on one. But one day, this is guy is a terrorist. Mm -hmm. the, what is a terrorist? This is just so loaded. And so like, so uh, I would say, uh, I would say, it's just horrible. Mm -hmm. And then Senegal is like, interrogated you for five days, came back to America and said, we couldn't find anything. What, what are you talking about? They said, uh, they said, you know, to hold him. Said, no, you can take him back to the US if you want, but not here. American also said they don't have evidence to take him to the US. I have to provide them this evidence. So they sh were shopping for a country to do the dirty job mm -hmm. for, of torture and to force me to confess. They put me on a special plane, mm -hmm. a French plane that they chartered. And they took me back to Mauritania because one of the Senegalese asked me where I want to go. I said, I'm going back to Canada. No more, because now I know the plan. They, the Americans said, no, you don't have a choice anymore. We're taking you to Mauritania. They took me to Mauritania. I was interrogated for about a month, again, Mauritania came back to the US and said, we couldn't find anything. 
what's going on? What's, you can take it. American said, okay, you put him on house arrest after they released me, but mm -hmm. after several weeks, they said, take his passport and don't let him go anywhere. That's exactly what Mauritania did until 9-11. I was put in a plane and shipped to Jordan and that the, 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 the start of a very painful journey. Jordan, I mean, for context, it's quite known for torture tactics when it comes to, to prisoners uh, on the most part. Yes. How, how, was, how was your time in Jordan? It was horrible. I really wanted the plane to crash. I didn't want the plane to arrive to Jordan. Mm -hmm. It was like, like living through death over and over and over slowly. It was, it was like the journey from Nuakchot to Jordan was like 12 hours. Mm -hmm. They, they uh, stopped on many, on three airports I was aware of. One of them is uh, Cyprus. Really? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, I was hoping that the uh, Cyprus authorities come to the plane and check because this is a foreign plane and we are stopping. And I was at least an illegal uh, crosser because I didn't have a passport, I didn't have a visa. How could they allow me to cross? Because I just want to shout, I'm a criminal, take me to prison. I just want to get out of that plane, you know. <laughs> I can imagine. I mean, obviously only if you're comfortable saying, but what did they do on that plane or what did you have to endure on that plane journey? Uh, I mean, yeah, they start interrogating me. Mm -hmm. And because the plane was so loud, the interrogation was not fruitful because they were shouting and they couldn't hear me, we couldn't hear each other. They had to stop it halfway and then wait till I get to Jordan and they start the interrogation. Mm -hmm. You know, most of what happened, so I was in uh, eight months, all isolation. I never seen anyone. I never was, I was never allowed to see. Even the Red Cross, I wasn't allowed. They put you most of the time in the basement. I think you say in your country, cellar. I didn't know most of the time, day or night. And uh, I was physically beaten. I remember only once. All the other time was just like threatening. Or one time they took me to a, a torture room. They were torturing a guy. And I was blindfolded. And that was very, very horrific experience. No, telling me this is what's going to happen. After eight months, Jordanian came back to America. That's, we know that later on from record of my lawyers. Came back, said, there is nothing against this guy. We don't have anything. We couldn't find anything. That, that's when Americans decide to take me from Jordan to uh, Afghanistan, and then from Afghanistan to Guantanamo Bay. So obviously, I mean, I know Afghanistan was an unpleasant place to be because in the I think in the film they describe it as as a pit or something. That, you know, it, it's not the nicest place to be uh, be kept. What was the transfer like from Afghanistan to Guantanamo Bay? And when did you realize that you were being taken to Cuba? So when the Jordanian came to me, they, uh, the guard came to me and said, you're going home. I was crying. You know, like eight months in a hole. Mm -hmm. Incommunicado, nothing, no letters, no call, nothing, just interrogation. And you become a different person. You have nothing to do with the world, just eight months. And I was crying, crying. 
and then I was just like a child. They yeah. like moved me, signed this paper, signed this paper, signed this paper. And I signed the paper in my head because I was like keeping a calendar in my head. In my head, it was 31st of July, 2000. When I looked at the paper, they wrote the date to sign, it was 20th of July. I was like, not bad. For some reason, 11 days. 11 days. Yeah. Long. So, even though I thought every day I was one, two, three, four, five, six, next month. So, every day. And this shows you like how vulnerable humans are. And uh, just the flow of time, it's so, so relative. Well, it's important so to keep a hold of as well. I think it's important for sanity to realize how long you've been stuck in one place. So they took me to the airport and I was like thinking, okay, now I meet my family, who cares about how long? And then I go back to life, but how is life, you know? But when they put me, because I couldn't see or hear, mm -hmm. they put me in another plane, and then they start like to cut open my clothes with scissors. Mm -hmm. And that felt really, really weird. Why they do this to me? Then they stripped me naked. And then they put a diaper. And then, and then they took a little bit of my blindfold mm -hmm. and then to see my they were to see my eyes then i saw the uh, the arm of the guy it was blonde you know and i knew i was in the hands of american team mm -hmm. and that's when it da dawned on me that i'm not going back home I figure I'm going to an American violent prison just like the one I see on movies and documentaries. And I'm going to die alone and forgotten. You know, I'm, I'm nobody in America. A Muslim, brown person from Africa, I had no chance. I stand no chance. Immediately no just after 9-11 as well. After 9-11. Not... And I said, that's it. And then it came to me that, you know, this is like death. The only thing I regretted are like the bad comments I made to friends or family or the bad gesture I made when, when I was unfriendly. That mm -hmm. also hurt me so bad. And I, I didn't regret money. I didn't regret not being rich. I didn't regret not being very tall, handsome man. I didn't regret not having these very hot girls I meet or see. None of that mattered to me. Mm -hmm. What mattered to me, being a good person, a nice person. And, and at that point, I asked God, I don't know why. I asked God to have a son. And then I asked, I took it upon myself to be nice all the time. And I'm telling you, Harry, it's very hard to be nice. <laughs> I can only imagine. Especially with the people you really love and care about. They sometimes they really push you to your limits. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people say that I just shut down. When I push to limits, shut down because... I already have, uh, you know, uh, uh, what you call it. I already have a resolution mm -hmm. not to say bad things to anyone. Yeah. And I, so far, I'm trying to keep that resolution for the rest of my life. Well, I mean, I, I think I, I, when I was doing doing preparation for the interview, you can you can go on the countless number of interviews that you've done and and the comments about the film and stuff like that. And despite the content 
in the film and the content of what you say, the number one comment is always about how you've still got a smile on your face after all of it. <laughs> how you've managed to come through the end of your torment and still somehow, you know, have a positive spin on the world. But so, so you've arrived in, in Guantanamo, obviously with the expectation that you would go into Mauritania. What was that first day like in, in Guantanamo and how hard was it to adjust to your new surroundings and your new life? So I spent about two or three weeks in uh, Afghanistan for interrogation, mm -hmm. you know. And this is ironic because Americans said, we want to take the bad guys out of Afghanistan, but they bring the bad guys, quote unquote, to Afghanistan. <laughs> if I was a bad guy, neither do I have interest to go to Afghanistan, nor do they supposedly have any interest, but they took me to Afghanistan. To complete the number, you know, for, you know, for the visual, for the TV, they took me there, and uh, for interrogation, I didn't speak any English, so, so they brought me a German, uh, German speaker, translator, yeah, yes, Mishael, and uh, he was, uh, you know, he was the nicest guy to me. And I remember the first day he came to me in interrogation. And this is nice. He said, password to your email address. I was like, I start negotiating. I, I said, but this is my privacy answer. He said, either you give it or we force you to give it. So, so you can pick your choice. And I gave him my password. This is like Harry, like, this is so like degrading and mm -hmm. so like horrible that someone tells you, give me the key of to your house. I can see everything you have. I can't take anything from your house. I can't. Mm -hmm. you, have, you are no person. You have nothing is holy in you because no. you are a terrorist. You know, I gave him and I was always like, you know, like we say my heart was on, on a needle all the time because what if they see something they don't like in my email? I mean, my email was very mundane, obviously. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you. And, but it's, it was so degrading. And so, anyway. But he was talking to me. He, he was very open. You know, German, like very open people in general, that's the stereotype. He told me, Mohammed, whether you're guilty or not guilty, it doesn't matter. You will never get out of it. Because that's how Americans think. You know, once you, they think you're a bad person, you're a bad person. And <clears throat> But he told me, I'm going to transfer you to Guantanamo Bay. Mm -hmm. And I was happy when he explained to me that Guantanamo Bay was controlled by the U.S. I said, this is U.S. This is U.S. of A, the leader of the free world, the country that freed Europe from fascism and Nazism, the country that everybody looked up when they think about freedom and human rights, and human rights, nothing will happen. They just will say, okay, this was a very big mix up, a very big mistake. You're free to go and I can go and live in the United States of America. I never dreamed to live there, but I guess it's a good thing. <laughs> you know, because yes. So many people go there, <clears throat> you know, that's it. And I was big, you know, I was in for a very big surprise when they start torturing me very heavily in Guantanamo Bay. How long was now, it in Guantanamo before the torture started? I arrived August 5th of 2002. 
Torture program start uh, May 22nd of 2003. I don't know how many months is that. I yeah. guess nine months. And what was the first? Because obviously, I mean, you've not seen the worst side of Guantanamo Bay yet, or you've not experienced it anyway. What was so those I months see- like? I just want your audience to understand. When I say torture, mm-hmm. I mean real torture. Like oh, God, yeah. Beating, sexual assault. Because being in Guantanamo Bay is torture. Mm-hmm. I was being interrogated insistently. And I couldn't. That's day number one. This is day number one. And I couldn't opt. You know, when you're in prison, you know, you say, I'm not, I'm not going to interrogation. You cannot do that. In, in, they take you interrogation anytime they want. Being in Guantanamo Bay is torture enough. They don't even need to design any program. Yeah. But they thought it's important to design a torture program, systematic torture program. Well, I, I think I'd, I've heard you talking in previous interviews about how you were quite... I mean, jokey maybe is probably the word. Uh, you, you'd have, you'd be quite jovial with your interrogators at times, until at, at some point you realised that it would get you in trouble and get you tortured uh, because of it. What was your relationship like with the people who were t- interrogating you day in day out before the special uh, program started? Yeah, so. I uh, I was like very you know it was like okay what's your name where did you go what university and so and then I said okay that's enough I'm not cooperating with you anymore and but if you tell me why you would kidnap me I can't talk to you and I stuck there you tell me why you brought me and I tell you my life. I don't owe you anything. I don't, I don't owe you any answer. And they were very frustrated with me because I just kept like, like you said, joking. Like they would tell me, oh, uh, they repeat the question. Like they ask me the same question every day. And I say, I remember the answer I told you. They say, we just want to make sure you are not lying. I say, you think I wouldn't remember the lie? I remember all my lies and I can repeat them over and over. And uh, they, uh, they asked me, why did you study microelectronics? And I would say, ah, okay, I didn't think I need to apply and ask you what, what I <laughs> Very defiant, very defiant. Because when I was a child, I get beaten up by other children stronger than me because I had very sharp tongue, always, that I couldn't back up, you know. And that's exactly what happened, you know. You know, because, you know, I don't know how much you know about American culture. American people are very smart people, you know, extremely smart. This is in general, you know, especially the people I deal with, you know, are very qualified, they are chosen, the elite, they are very well trained, they are very patient, and they have a program, and they have strategy, and they have, you know, a schedule. And I'm one person. In Communicado, I have no information. And they sit, you know, in, uh, uh, you know, in meeting after meeting after meeting, figuring out what to do with me. So I was completely outgunned and outnumbered. Mm-hmm. And then I was just using these like stupid like jokes with them. And they kept telling me they think they have this obsession. You know, they say, you know, when you when you when you confess, you show us that you are a real man, and then we uh, you know we reduce your sentence and then you know, we give you a lot of items in your cell, and then you will go home in three years. I, I, I 
Like this drives me crazy. Talk too much. I didn't do anything. Why should I confess to anything? And I don't need your mercy. I don't need any leniency. I don't need anything. I just need you to get me the hell out of this place and let me go. Well, you, That's well, it. They say this guy is hopeless. <laughs> and then they give me to the torture team. That's well, it. Before we get onto the, the torture team, I mean, the, the common denominator almost in every uh, country and a detention center that you were put into was that they'd investigate you or interrogate you and come up with nothing and say quite openly to the other agencies, Mohamedou knows absolutely nothing about what we're asking him. Why do you think personally that they were trying to pin it on you? Uh, look, uh, I think there is some time kind of obsession of law enforcement. It doesn't matter what country or because I think this is I think this is our brain. Mm -hmm. You know, when you uh, I give you an example that is very far from you. You know, I don't know when you were much younger and you were obsessing about a girl. And then you think this is the girl and you are completely blinded, you know, from all the bad things that this girl has. And then you think this is the girl. She is so pretty. Oh my God, look at her. Look how she talks. Look. Because I think the brain, you know, likes always to be comfortable and believe in simple things. Yeah. I am as a bad guy, very simple choice. I am a freaking Muslim. I am an Arab Berber from West Africa. I look like the guy on the most wanted list. I speak languages. And for any interrogator, any given interrogator to pin me down and to show that I'm the guy, this is a very big bonus mm -hmm. because they say, oh, you are so smart and like taking me out would be much more important than taking out a farmer. That's how they think. Mm -hmm. And they just, they just, they just were obsessed with me. We know now, Harry, from record of US government that in 2005, they conclusively found out that I was innocent. 2005. We know that because we have it written in a document. But they coldly let me rot and waste my youth and my life in prison. All because you, to them, I mean, tick all the boxes, bar the box that all the is... Boxes. Bar the box that is actual malice and, and want to hurt people. <laughs> it's... Look like a dog, bark like a dog, walk like a dog. That's what they told me. I never heard that. I, I think this is very stupid, honestly. Uh, mm -hmm. Very stupid thing to say, look like a dog, walk like a dog. And maybe it's another animal we don't know. Oh, who, who is... Yeah, it, I, obviously... They, because you ticked all those boxes, they were desperate to, I mean, you said yourself, they were desperate to to get a confession out of you. And because you were so resilient, the only way they could do that was was torture you for, for 70 days. Obviously, I know how horrifically sensitive it is, but are you able to talk me through what those 70 days was like and how you were able to cope for those 70 days? Uh... Harry, the 70 days is only the beginning. It's not the, the whole program. The whole program stretch uh, one year, about one year. Mm -hmm. So the 70 days, the start. Yes. When Richard Zuli took over. Richard Zuli is a cop from Chicago and he's known for torturing mostly black people and forcing them to confess. 
actually when I, I know cases because the, some of the lawyers of his victims contacted him and we talked because they, they want me to help them. I know what, at least one case I saw where he put a guy 20 years behind bars, torturing him to confession in the United States of America, in Chicago. And this is a democracy. This is not a military dictatorship. <clears throat> and for some reason, the US government saw in him the perfect candidate to deal with the evil Muslims and Arabs, whatever. And he came and he was very well equipped, equipped with no shackles, no laws, he could do anything. He could beat me, he could assault me sexually. They started 70 days no sleep. They used different tactics for no sleep. Like interrogation, continuous, many shifts. And then they put me in the cold room. You have nothing, just the uniform, nothing. And the uniform is very thin. And I'm talking to you, uh, compared to other detainees, I'm lucky because Muhammad Gul did not survive the cold room. He died of hypothermia. And uh, Dali War did not survive. He, he did not survive the beating. In Bagram, he died. And the military tried to say, like, natural cause. And the guy is a taxi driver. He has nothing to do with anything. You know, you can look him up, that he was. And I'm talking to you because I survived. And people say, oh, you're strong. I say, I'm, I'm a survivor. The people who didn't survive, Everybody who survived is strong because the other people you don't get to talk to. So you don't get to compare me with anyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kept telling, uh, uh, Richard Zuli is not someone you can negotiate with because he is like the power, all power and so, but he is like henchman. I was talking to one Ranika, you know, Navy Lieutenant. <laughs> I told them, look, I'm dying. You are killing me because they stopped giving my medication. I had like this hypotension and uh, sciatic nerve. And uh, she said, no, we have doctors. We know everything. I said, you don't know how strong I am. And then they start with sexual assault. At three different occasions, I was physically sexually assaulted. Beating, they broke my ribs. Uh, Mark uh, drowning, took me to the boat ride. Then they start choking me with water. And so on and so forth. But when he came to me, Richard Zulian told me, your mother is going to be kidnapped and put in only man prison. I know I had nothing to lose anymore. I was ready. I was broken. I told them, you want anything you want, I, I will confess. They asked me to write my confession and they helped me. They told me uh, that I supposedly was planning to uh, attack the CN Tower, a place I never heard of before. And then I wrote, I signed everything. To get that, that uh, a confession out of you. I, 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 I want to talk about the the mock execution, if that's a, okay, because that's something that they show in the film and something that is one of the most sinister and shocking things, I think, is the fact that they took you out on a boat with, uh, I think it was, was Egyptian and kind of uh, torture yes. squads. And, yeah. Are you able to explain yeah. your experience of that? You know, <laughs> it's, it's very painful, you mm -hmm. know, because one, 
when they start beating me, like very bro. So there was like three teams together. So one Syrian, one Egyptian, that's one team. And then an American team. So they were, so each has different tactics. So the, the Americans, they did beating a lot. Mm -hmm. The beating when they broke my ribs, I couldn't breathe because every breath was so painful, you know, and I, I almost suffocated. Then they start to uh, tilt my head and pour water over my head. Mm -hmm. And it's salt water, it's very nice. Yeah, the Egyptian team basically and the Syrian team, they just beat me, but they were much more, I think used to this, I guess. Because they kept like pouring ice on my body, you know, and mm -hmm. they let the ice sit for some time. They, they start beating me, slapping me, beating me everywhere. You know? This is like a technique, I think, in order to work, not to lift. I, I don't want to explain anything because this is all twisted, but this is oh, what happened. Yeah. And then they took me to this place called Echo Camp. A torture mm -hmm. camp, known, called Echo. And, <clears throat> and uh, for many days, between August, I think 23rd, and October 10th, I, I wasn't aware of anything. Mm -hmm. How do I know that? First, when they are on arrive at this place, the medic, you know, was cursing me, and, but he was giving medication too. And I saw his watch. It says, I think, 1.32 in the morning. And I saw the day too. And month later, also I saw the watch of my interrogator, First Sergeant Shell. It says October 10th. So, between those dates, I was in and out of consciousness. I don't know where I was. I don't know what they did to me. I don't know what I did myself for the most part. After the confession, they, uh, they want to put me to death. Mm -hmm. And so many agencies were, uh, were involved and they wanted to uh, make sure everything was correct. And they asked for a polygraph. When they came with polygraph, I said, hey, I didn't do anything. And because if I say my confession over the polygraph, I would fail. I know how this works. Mm -hmm. And then they were discussing. They said, OK, we just tell us the truth on polygraph. And I acquitted myself 100%. I said, I never thought to harm anyone. I never had any intention to harm them. And I passed the polygraph two times, 100%, no deception. I mean, the fact that it had to get that far before they, they gave you the opportunity to acquit yourself was, it, it just, just baffled them to me. Well, I do want to ask, obviously, I mean, that's such a horrible ordeal to go through. And you talk, you've talked in the past about, you started off quite jokey, and then, I mean, essentially they, they broke you and ground you down. How, as a person, obviously you're sitting in front of me as a jokey and, and smiley person now, how do you rebuild that part of you that gets ground down and broken by, by torture? You cannot. <laughs> Just the other day, I went to the hospital. You know, I, there are triggers. Mm -hmm. you know? and when some situation happens in front of me, I pass out. You know? mm -hmm. When anything that brings back those bad memories, you know, I always try to put a brave face, but uh, post-traumatic, you know? Yeah, it's, of course. It's true. And the, the fact that I haven't been recognized as a survivor, as a victim. It's so hurtful. 
I mean, I tried twice to visit your country because I have work to do. I have movie to promote. And twice they said, no, because you are a bad guy, because you were in Guantanamo Bay. This is so hurtful, you know, this circular argument. You are, you went to Guantanamo Bay because you deserve to be in Guantanamo Bay. You know, that's so. Despite know. being, I mean, it's worth the context. Obviously, it, if people who have watched the film will, will know, but the film follows um, Nancy Hollander fighting for your, your habeas rights. And um, yes, I won everything. You, you won your I habeas won corpus everything. trial. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I went, there is not one place they took me to that I didn't win. Because I didn't do anything, that's obvious. But that a great country like the UK is not recognizing me as a victim, as a peaceful person who is allowed to do his work, to pick up the pieces, is very disheartening. It's very yeah. disheartening. You know, at the same time, mm -hmm. the people who torture me have no problem coming to your country. And this is so twisted. You know, where is justice? Where is human right? Where is democracy? You know, where is like the first democracy in the world? Like that wrote the uh, Carta Mag Magna, Magna Carta. Magna Carta, yeah. Yeah, Magna Carta, where is that? Where is all of that? I mean, and the, and the the horrible thing is as well as like um, Zuli, because of his stance in terms of the the navy, would probably be welcomed into a lot of countries with with fanfare. Yeah. Yet yes. you're you're a, a, essentially a prisoner in your own country now. The, uh, the the cell is is just so much bigger. Do you, do you feel that? Yeah, it's very twisted. And I, I, what is pub, public like pressure? What is public participation and all of this? One, one always asks, and there is no answer. Like, there is always like the world is always led by an elite. Mm -hmm. And this elite is like a tribe. And the, the small guys hardly have any say. And I'm not exactly a small guy anymore because uh, thank God for the movie, the publicity and the book. And I'm doing all of this to speak for those detainees who completely silence and intimidate it, you know? And I'm saying, I'm not doing this. We are victims and we should be welcome. We should be called as witnesses, mm -hmm. you know? Donald Trump's fell when he comes to your country, is welcome with red carpet. And he did very horrible crimes when he ordered torture. You know, that's, you know, it's just beyond me. Honestly. No, it's disgusting. Uh, the, Guantanamo Bay obviously has been cut down in terms of the, the people there, but there are still, I think, 70, uh, 70 people still in Guantanamo Bay. Um, well, there are still... 40, sorry. There are 40 people still in Guantanamo Bay. There are still detention centers, similar, maybe not as extreme, around the world. Uh, and Joe Biden has said that he wants to, to shut down Guantanamo Bay, but it was the same as what Obama said, and that never materialized. Do you, What needs to be done regarding the future of these kind of facilities, and who does that fall to? And what could you say, what would you say to them if you, if you had a one-on-one -on -one with them? I did write a letter to Joe Biden. I believe in him. I think he's a good guy. And uh, he lost his wife when she was very young. He lost his son. I cannot even imagine that feeling of losing your son. And, uh, and Guantanamo Bay is a crime because you cannot hold people outside the rule of law. And they should shut it down because it's, uh, it's an insult to human rights. It's an insult to the values of the United States of America itself and of the uh, international recognized uh, standards. 
and it should be shut down. And those people should be uh, resettled safely and should be helped to pick up the pieces and live their life. People who committed crime, they can go to court, you know, and have lawyers and be prosecuted to the extent of the law. This is so simple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's a reality that for some reason, some official can't seem to get to grips with. But Mohammed, thank you so much for, for sitting down to speak to me. It really has been an honor uh, to speak thank to you. Thank you so much, Harry. Thank you so much. Just say hi to Pretty Patel. And tell her <laughs> I'm a good guy and she should let me in. I, I don't Just think I don't want to go anywhere near that woman. <laughs> I, I was saying that she's a little bit frustrated. Yeah, I, I, think, <laughs> I think you're right. Um, we, yeah, all the best. And I hope I hope uh, you have a, a fantastic Ramadan and, and everything. Oh, well, I, yeah, I really hope you have a good rest of your day.